Welcome to lesson number four of our studies for this quarter. And this is a special weekend for the KNFC conference as we're having a revival weekend. And I'm so blessed again and privileged to have Brian Hall with us. You'll also see him later this afternoon in a powerful presentation that he has prepared for us. Um, But now we're doing the lesson together. Brian, welcome to the lesson study. Thank you, Renier. It's always a blessing to uh, be with you and to be able to reach out to our members in this way. Amen. Can you open with prayer for us before we start the lesson? Yes, sure. Let us pray. Father in heaven, what a wonderful privilege is ours to meet with you, the commander, the monarch of the universe. As our creator and our God, we are thankful that we can be able to study your word again. Thank you that heaven is always open and always looking down to lift us up out of the chaos, out of the distractions and the sin of this world. We thank you that your spirit is promised to all who ask in faith and so we plead now for your Holy Spirit to bless the study of your word, bless the viewers and listeners that Lord your word may be truly a light unto our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the title of the lesson today is The Bible, the Authoritative Source of Our Theology. Our text for today, our memory text, is Isaiah 8 verse 20, very popular text um, that we as a church use, refer to a lot. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now, Brian, when we look into the world, when it comes to the interpretation of Scripture and the interpretation of our religion religion or our belief, that which we base our faith upon, we see that there are various ways that people use to come to the conclusion of what they believe. And this, this lesson really delves into some of the methods that people use and unfortunately sometimes uh, use it as above the Bible as that is their authority that they base their doctrines upon. And some of it is tradition, culture, experience, reason, and then ultimately the one we should base it upon, the Bible. And I believe we can have an interesting discussion today, Brian, when it comes to these specific areas, because I do believe there's good in all of them. It's just we must make sure that that good is based upon the goodness of the Bible and the interpretation of what Scripture is telling us. So the first one that we're going to look at is tradition. Tradition is important. In many cultures, you know, we have our traditions. And Mark 7, Jesus speaks to the Pharisees because they, you know, are accusing Jesus and his disciples that they eat with unwashed hands. And they had many other rituals. And it's specific in the Bible, it says it's tradition of the elders. So it's not something that God gave to the people. It's a tradition that they started, which then they make they made into this. It's almost like a religious precept. If you do not follow it, you know, you are sinning against the Almighty. Brian, what are your thoughts when it comes to tradition? And in this story where Jesus said to them, um, you hold in vain, you worship me, keeping on to the doctrines of man. So, Renier, that's quite an interesting uh, question. Uh, and many people, you know, understand that there are good tradition and there are bad traditions. And uh, unfortunately, with time, traditions become more and more specific. They change. Lots of additions take place. And then you find out that uh, the original uh, design for that tradition from the beginning as somehow changed to something else and even in this case as we see in Mark chapter 7 it was even more important than the commandments of God and uh, it's quite interesting mm. that Jesus answered by saying uh, that in he, he said in vain do you worship me teaching for doctrines uh, the commandments of men so their tradition um, had replaced the commandments of God so uh, Jesus again last week uh, we were looking at, um, you know, the uh, written word of God. 
uh, and why it was written. So, so Jesus now quotes in, in answering to their offense to the fact that the disciples uh, were eating with unwashed hands according to the tradition of the elders. Uh, and then he says, it is written, and then he quotes from the book of Isaiah, and in this case he's quoting Isaiah 29 verses 13, and he says to them um, that uh, Isaiah has written that, um, you know, you worship with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. So, you know, the, the issue here now is, is God's word that which we have hidden our hearts so that, you know, tradition does not become more important or supersede the word of God. In their case now, I mean, they had grossly rejected the commandments of God. I mean, they, they had a tradition um, that um, if you donated your, your wealth to the temple uh, for whatever good uh, while you were alive, then, you know, um, you could use your means to not support your family because you know sometimes that can take a lot of money to support your parents especially when they're getting old and things need to be taken care of you are mm -hmm. uh, exempt from taking care of your parents because when you die your wealth was going to be given over to the temple uh, and of course the priests were in charge of it and who knows you know whether it was all properly recorded but the fact is jesus said uh, they had neglected taking care of their parents through this tradition where they could declare it is Corbin and then, you know, they didn't have to give their money over to their parents. So clearly your tradition was a terrible thing and Jesus condemned mm. them and said, listen, it is written. This is not the way how you're supposed to do things. And it's unfortunate that in, you know, there are churches today that have many traditions that's mm. based upon church tradition and not based upon the scriptures. And I know, you know, a couple of decades ago, even um, centuries ago, you know, people were really put in a place where fear was used as a tool in line with tradition to get people to worship in a certain way so that, um, you know, the people can get them and receive the money that they needed, the, these, these, the leadership, etc. And it was really a wrong way of using um, tradition during the dark ages, especially. It was really a terrible, terrible time that people faced because of tradition, putting the church above the Bible. And we, as God's remnant, as His faithful people, we must be careful that we do not fall into the same trap and make tradition and make it above the Bible. But yet there are good traditions that we can also hold on to that, you know, does not conflict with the Bible. It is for us to go to the Holy Spirit and ask Him, what is your will? What is your will as revealed in the Word of God? Now, Brian, in 1 Corinthians 11, 2 and 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, maybe we can read one of them. Uh, let's read 1 okay. Corinthians 11, 2, where the lesson gives examples where there were times that the apostles said, you know, follow our tradition. Mm -hmm. So I want to know from you, what was he saying with that? We're talking about tradition and that it can be Jesus rebuking it. Yet the apostles said, follow our tradition. 1 Corinthians 11 and right. verse 2. If you can read that for us, please. Okay, I'm reading the King James Version. It says, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Okay, uh, so this, three your, well. your trans. No, just verse 2. So your translation two. says the ordinances, the New King James says the traditions. And that's the right. same, I think, what the lesson is trying to refer to. And then in Second Thessalonians 3, 6, we have the same thing. Now, Brian, how can we distinguish between the Word of God and tradition? And Paul, you are saying, you know, follow our traditions. Uh, mm. What do you think he was trying to say in regard to tradition in relation to the Bible? Well, uh, here, Paul, of course, taking, you know, his example from Jesus himself, who had some wonderful traditions. And another word you can use for tradition would be custom. So it's something that you do repetitively, yes. uh, something that is handed down uh, and not necessarily written, although uh, many of them were written. Uh, so one of the customs that Jesus had, or one of his traditions was uh, every Sabbath, he would go down to the synagogue where he would go and worship and there he would uh, read from one of the scribes 
uh, scrolls on the book of Isaiah or the book of Daniel or the book of Jeremiah uh, or whatever the Holy Spirit impressed him. So they, they are good traditions. I mean, uh, every Wednesday uh, I look forward to having a prayer meeting, which uh, I gather with you. That's, that's a very good tradition. So, so Paul yes. spoke of many things uh, when he went around to the different churches and here he's pointing them to traditions that are supported by the Word of God, not the traditions mm. of the world, the traditions of the elders. Uh, in the book of Galatians, he speaks to them that, you know, some of you observe days and, and months uh, and times of the year, speaking of feasts. Uh, it could be mm. also, you know, other things. You know, uh, Paul said, no, 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 um, let us stick with the plain rudiments of uh, the Word of God. So good tradition is supported by the Word of God. Bad tradition is that which goes against the Word of God. I, I remember, Renier, when I was still very young, um, one of the traditions that the women had in our church, uh, it wasn't a bad one, but uh, today we just don't see it. It's like non-existent, was my mum, my sisters, they would all wear ladies' hats when they went to church. And they looked yes. quite nice in the hats. But, you know, uh, mm. these days, you know, women just don't do that. So that was a tradition or a custom that they had those days. It wasn't a bad one. Um, actually, mm. you know, some of the, the, the bad ones uh, have come in and then some of the good ones have left. But uh, nonetheless, uh, our tradition or culture or our uh, uh, I I any other method that we have that we worship God with should always be, first of mm. all, sanctioned by the Bible, by the Word of God. The example that you gave is actually a very good example. It reminded me of um, some of the issues that I had to face already in church uh, when it comes to, you know, women having to cover their heads because of what Paul says in this very chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter right. 11. Yes. And, you know, it, as you say, you know, it was really a nice thing for the, for the woman to wear the hats. But as soon as you, you make it as the Pharisees made the washed hands, as in, if you don't do it, you're not in God's will, um, you're yeah. sinning against Him, that's really, really, you know, you're making something ugly that's actually something beautiful. And, right. you know, but it's up to a person's, per, person's personal choice. Other traditions that we have, Brian, like in our church, is camp meeting. You know, once a year we come together and we, yes. we, we, we really worship God together, etc. And then, you know, some people try to make this ugly too. You see how the devil has really come in and say, no, you need to do it during the time of tabernacles when the f actual biblical feast took place and you're not doing it the right way because not the feast. So once again, you know, the devil has brought in his, uh, he, his ways and it's, it's really made it difficult. The beautiful things that we have, he's trying to destroy. So there are beautiful yes. traditions. We just shouldn't become like the Pharisees when it's a tradition. Right. And uh, they are beautiful ones. And it is, it is, some of them are really good things. So that's tradition. We must line it up with Scripture and make sure that we're within God's will when it comes to tradition. Then there is experience. Now, Romans 2, 4, I would like to read that. It's one of my favorite texts when it comes to repentance. Mind Romans you. 2, 4. Romans 2, 4. And it reads, Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? So God is the author of repentance. He is the one that takes the first step. He's the foundation. He, he, he's everything in it. You just cooperate with Him. That's the basic, basic thing that um, Paul is trying to say. But mm. this is an experience that you and I need to experience. And Titus 3, 4, and 5 is also a powerful text that the lesson refers to. Yes. Now, Brian, w is it important that you and I, within the faith of Christianity, have a living experience with God? Absolutely, Rainier. And, and God works uh, with us through leading us into experiences that validate His Word. So our experience should never take the place of the Word of God. You know, today many uh, well-meaning Christians, you know, um, they uh, go according to, you know, well, the Spirit has just led me into this mm. year and uh, I was, 
you know, being able, I was able to speak in tongues and, and they give their experience as being even more important than what I've heard in some circles they say, well, if you don't speak in tongues, and this is not the true gift yes. in the Bible, by the way, they say, well, mm. then, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is not in you. So we always mm. have to be careful that our experience does not lead us away. You know, uh, Saul, the first king of Israel, was led away, you know, into um, leading, uh, into going to listen to a, a witch. And, and lost yes. his salvation as a result of his experience uh, and, and just mm. shows you know what what he saw what he heard must have been really you know uh, electrifying and his, his senses seemed to have like taken it all in uh, but he lost his life but now when I go to Paul uh, who was also Saul, Saul of Tarsus who became Paul mm. now he had a real life-changing experience on the way to Damascus where he experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself, uh, who comes to mm. him through that experience, then he's led to the church and to Ananias, one of the leaders of the church, and then of course he's led to scripture and the word. So, so all the time our experience must always bring us back to the word. Oh, definitely. And once again, you've used an example without planning it before the time that I would use it too. And it's the one of speaking in tongues. Uh, we have right. worked with so many people and heard of so many people, as soon as they, and, and people that have come into Adventism, into the truth, where they said you must, one of the hardest things for them was to let go of this whole speaking in tongues thing, because it was a real experience. But right. to then line it up to Scripture to see that it's not biblical, it's really a hard thing for someone to deal with. Because their thoughts and their feelings are greatly affected by this. I've experienced in my Christian walk that there were so many amazing experiences in the last 14 years that God has put me through. Real experiences that has pointed me back to Scripture and to His Word and His will. How He gave me my wife and, and many other examples. Um, and the fact that He, on the 3rd of September in 2009, through the Scriptures, pointed that He would give me a wife. And then seven months later, for Chantal and I to come together, we used another scripture to point to the exact same scripture he gave me, but it's a different one, but it's the same language, to show that she was the one. And then for her to tell me that her birthday is on the 3rd of September, the same day that God chose before I knew she existed, before she was an Adventist. That day he chose to tell me that he's going to give me a wife. Now that was an amazing experience. It was really real for me, how God used his word. And then there were times where self was in control and I thought God was speaking, God was leading and certain things happened and you base your, your, your next step then on that experience and then it doesn't work out. Mm. So it is so important, vitally important that we always base our experience on the word of God but we do not make our experience the rule of our faith. Meaning it always overrides the Bible because it really happened. It must always come in line with the Bible. This is something that I'm really passionate about, is that experience is vitally important. Is Jesus real in your life? But your personal experience does not override Scripture. You must always Absolutely. align that experience with what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 3, Paul tells us when it comes to our experience, he says, he uses the words simplicity in Christ. Mm. Yes. Let's make it simple. Let's, Brian, what do you have to say about this text especially? The simplicity in Christ when it comes to our experience. So, that's a very important question, uh, Renier, because uh, many times, you know, uh, we can be so led away by our experiences. And uh, I've had some wonderful experience where, you know, in prayer, you know, the Holy Spirit has just come upon me and you just sense the presence of the Lord and, and you you. you dive into the word and understand it uh, and it's clear but but Paul would always say you know uh, that Christ uh, is our example he says follow me as I follow Christ and so as we look at uh, Jesus life it, it was not complicated you know he hadn't attended the rabbinical schools he didn't have a degree in theology uh, he wasn't a scribe he wasn't a Pharisee or doctor of the law but yet um, it says in the Bible the common people heard him gladly you know, uh, when Jesus spoke, uh, even the, the common people and the theologians uh, would exclaim, no, no man ever spoke like this man did, you know. So, so Jesus, mm. uh, the simplicity of the gospel is that 
if we will look at the life of Jesus, and you know, and Jesus was, uh, his, his life was so well structured. Um, he'd get up early in the morning and the first thing he would do, he would commune with heaven. You know, uh, prayer is, is not just connecting, but communing with God. And there's a little bit mm. difference between connection and communion. And then from there, yes. you know, he would spend time in the Word. And then he was ready for the day. Now, if you look at Jesus' life, Jesus treated people with kindness. Uh, Jesus was mm. courteous. Uh, Jesus would never leave someone who needs help, uh, you know, yes. and, and say, I'm too busy. So the simplicity of the gospel was that Jesus' life was the epitome. It was the... The living word reflected in his habitual acts, his words, his uh, speech was always filled with kindness, with love and gratitude. So, so we don't have to be theologians to become Christians. No, we just need to mm. ask God to take charge of our lives, commit the soul, surrender the heart, the will. And once the will mm. is surrendered to God, you know, it becomes so beautiful as you read the Bible, it becomes alive and it's transforming. And that's what the simplicity of the gospel is. We behold Jesus Christ in his word. And as we behold him, the Holy Spirit leads us no matter what level we are. My dad wasn't well educated. He only had a third grade education in primary school. And, yes. But he could read the Bible. His English was not the best English, but man, you know, he was just such a kind gentle loving christian and that's what we ought to be kind gentle loving christians and if we behold christ that's that's what we will see yes as jesus said love god with all your heart and soul and love your neighbor as yourself it's simple right. mm -hmm. yet god does take 66 books to tell us what it looks like but mm -hmm. yet it is simple yes. so that's our experience our experience shouldn't override scripture scripture should interpret our experience the next one is culture. Now, culture, especially in South Africa, can sometimes, um, you know, override what Scripture says. Right. In my, my culture, it is like that, and I know in many other cultures of sure. South Africa. In 1 John, 5, 1 John 2, 5 to 7, 15 to 17, Brian, if you could read that for us. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Okay, I have it here again. I'm reading from the King James Version. All right, I'll wait until you found it. I'm there. All right, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then these important words. And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but there's the contradiction, uh, contradistinction. Mm. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. It reminds me of um, Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withers, yes. the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. So God's word is God's revealed will. Uh, and when we live out our lives according to his revealed will in his word, man... You know, we have the happiest moments in our lives. Uh, and yes. uh, I'm sure you can testify to that. Definitely. This is a powerful text where it says, It really is. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, mm. when it comes to our cultures, you know, all of our cultures, once again, almost the word tradition ca can very much line up with this uh, point here of culture. That's right. You know, many cultures... They have certain rituals when it comes to mm. burying the dead or mm. um, what happens at a marriage. It's like like <laughs> my culture is you sucky sucky when it's, when it's a wedding, you know. You, 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 <laughs> in Afrikaans they say lang arm. You, you dance um, in a certain way, in a bure type of way and the alcohol flows and you know, you really get drunk on your wedding day, etc. This is, uh, not everyone gets drunk, but it's basically what the white people do at their weddings so this is part of our culture our, our culture is to have bright plays and watch rugby etc etc the question is is are these culture principles or culture events part of god's revealed will or is right. it part of the world 
the part of this lesson really wants to, to bring out the fact that we need to separate ourselves from the world. If that means to let go of certain cultural things, then so mm. be it. Because as right. you say, Brian, it's happier and it's, you have greater joy being in the will of God than being mm. in the will of the world. What are your thoughts? Yes. So, so I'm just thinking as you're talking, um, uh, I came up to uh, a, 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 a culture, um, I came up close to a culture and I was asked a, um, a question when I was doing an evangelistic series in Kenya. And you and I were uh, supposed to be there right now, had it not been yes. for the coronavirus. But anyhow, yes. um, so the Lord was working powerfully during the evangelistic series. And so I was able to go into different homes with the different people there. Uh, and this is in Kisi town. So um, the, the culture there was um, many, many men. Uh, it was like a symbol of uh, power, a symbol of wealth to have women more, more uh, mm. not women but more than one wife so sure. so um some of these maasai and other people from these different uh, cultural backgrounds uh receive the word of god and then they come into the church um and then now the bible says you know um god ordained that there should be you know just one wife and one husband and the two shall yes. become one Right? So that's his, uh, they that's asked his me, image. That's, that's correct. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So they, they asked me the question, so what, what do we do with the, um, the, the people who have come in and now they have got more than one wife, the men that have more than mm -hmm. one wife. So, so yeah, uh, Ron Dupree actually has written a book on uh, polygamy. But anyhow, the point yes. is, uh, I said, you know, you, you can't just now, now put away the woman and the, the other wife and just like throw them out. Uh, the first one mm. that you got married to would be the first one uh, and then yes. yeah take care of the other ladies but you know they ought not to be living with you uh, and if yes. that's not possible then you know then there should be no uh, sexual uh, you know uh, contact with them so yes. some of these cultures you know um, they they somehow have lost you know things and, and there was bad culture in the bible too and so jesus mm. had to deal with all that but it's interesting in the modern age now uh, there's so much culture that comes from worldliness that uh, mm -hmm. it seems to have steeped in the church and that was the problem in the middle ages too the tradition and the culture of that time uh, people like martin luther and zwingli and Haas and jerome they had to mm -hmm. point people back to the word of god it reminds me to our, our scripture reading by the way to the law and the yes. testimony if they speak not according to this word then you know there's no light in that then that needs to be discarded Take that culture out, take that tradition out, that's not worth it. Yes, definitely. Spirit of Prophecy says to us in councils to parents, teachers and students, the followers of Christ are to be separate from the world in principles and interests, but they are not to isolate themselves from the world. The right. Savior mingled constantly with men, not to encourage them in anything that was not in accordance with God's will, but to uplift and ennoble them. So we should be different, we should be separate. Um, as Jesus said, you know, they're in the world, but not of the world. And God pr and Jesus prayed for his disciples that they will not be influenced by the world. So we right. hear, but we can stand, be, still be different and line ourselves and our lives in line with the word of God. Renina, thoughts just come to me. Could I just interject you there, please? Yes, no problem. Um, you, know, you know, one of the most powerful and strong cultures uh, back in the time of uh, Moses was the Egyptian culture. And mm. Moses, you know, was schooled and learned in all of the Egyptian culture and education and language. Uh, and he was a militarily skilled person as well. So when you think about the text in Hebrews that says, And Moses forsook the pleasures of sin for mm. a season, uh, and he esteemed it better to suffer reproach uh, and to go with God's will, uh, then to have all that he could have had and he could have been the next Pharaoh all the riches mm. and all the pleasures of sin but as we just read there they pass away the lust the pride of life it all passes away so so Moses yes. made the better choice and today is in heaven he has eternal life mm. 
if he had gone with his feelings, if he had gone with the popular opinions of the world during his time, Egypt was a fabulous uh, time of history. Man, today yes. he would be a mummy in a museum or somewhere under the ground in a pyramid or something like that. Mm. Sure, so there's a difference between the world and between the culture. Right. I remember when I was at Aldebar College, uh, Dr. Letzeli, one of my favorite lecturers, he said something in our African studies class. He said, Christ is above our culture. It always stuck with me. You know, when it comes to this Amen. culture thing, I always remember his words. Christ is above your culture. And that's what mm. we need to follow. Then reason. Reason is one of the things that people also use to establish customs, traditions, and um, doctrine. Second Corinthians 10.5 tells us we need to bring every thought into obedience of Jesus Christ. Then Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And Proverbs 9 verse 10 is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now Brian, how have you experienced, can you maybe give an example, I don't want to put you on the spot now, of where you've seen people use reason to actually discard what the Bible says. To actually say, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, miracles, it doesn't make sense, so it can't be real. Have you experienced anything like this? What are your thoughts on using reason to discard what the Word of God says? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember a, a wonderful family that were friends of our family. And I was still young those days, and my dad was having uh, Bible studies with his family. And, uh, you know, when it came to, uh, they were Sunday worshippers, right? They were, they, I shouldn't say Sunday worshippers. They, they worshipped on Sunday, and mm. they didn't uh, accept uh, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And for yes. them, you know, Sunday was something that they were accustomed to. It was part of their tradition, going to church on Sunday. And they wouldn't really keep the day holy, as the fourth commandment says, but they would go to church for sure. And so I remember yes. my dad, you know, having Bible studies with his family. And um, the father of the home seemed to have been coming along, but the, his wife had, was the more dominant in the marriage. And she was like, you know, really against all this year. And um, yes. they gave every reason as to why they felt, you know, Sabbath is not uh, important for us. So you've heard that before you do Bible studies, you're an evangelist. People say, well, you know, when Jesus died, you know, uh, all the yes. commandments were nailed the cross, not realizing it was the annual Sabbath and not the Lord's Sabbath. Yes. Um, and people give other reasons for it, you know, that, uh, well, you know what, it's not just important as long as you worship God in any day. So you've heard many reasons that people will give mm. as to why um, the Sabbath is not binding. Uh, and yet... When you hold up that reason to the Word of God, no matter how good your reasoning might be, it just doesn't square up with the Bible. Uh, and, and I've yes. seen people who have left off their reasoning and the reasoning of their pastors. I, I had one group that said, well, I'll have to talk to my pastor about it. You know, I said, well, what about the Word of God? Why don't you just consult the Word of God? You know, sure yes. enough, I'm not, I'm not negating, you know, how important pastors are. Uh, you know, pastors, if they are godly men and they are steeped in the word of God, you know, they can really guide the flock into wonderful experiences. Uh, but this particular couple, sadly, um, their reasoning was, well, you know what, if my pastor doesn't agree, and that's what happened. They went to the pastor, the pastor didn't agree, the pastor had came and they had a study with my dad, and sadly... They reason that if their pastor says, you know, the Sabbath is not important, mm. then for them it's not important. So, you know, sadly these things happen in the world. Yeah, that's unfortunate how people use reason. Not mm. knowing that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and both of mm. wisdom. Yes. And it's interesting when you study the fear of the Lord, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, it gives us more insights into what that means. And it means to love the Lord of all your heart and all your soul to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, to do what He says. Basically coming back to what we read in 1 John chapter 2, where it says, those who do the will of God abides forever. So you do His will, 
revealed will right. given in scripture so this is how we need to reason we reason in line with what the scriptures say and not right. what um, others say or you know i know that there are people that are very analytical for them to better understand something they need to reason it through they need to talk about it they need to ask the questions but we need to come back to what the bible says even though we've gone through that whole process of analyzing what the bible is actually trying to say to us and make sure yes. that we're still in line with what scripture says so reason is important god has given us the ability to reason but yeah. we need to submit that's why the fear of the lord we need to submit to the bible so that god can align our reason align our thoughts in line with his will i mean brian you and i both have sat with a gentleman we have um you have spoken to other people i've spoken to a lot of people you know especially with some of the doctrines that's coming into our church or that's especially in the last 10 years or so we people say you need to do this now in adventism even though it's not part of our fundamental beliefs neither do we believe that we still need to keep some of these things etc and then they will use reasoning alan white actually calls it human reasoning right to bring over their doctrine and then if you don't do it that way you don't see it that way then you're lost i've been told that i'll be lost if i do believe that god is a triune three person god it and it, it is it is amazing how we can look at the same text and then come to a different conclusion mm. one holy spirit one faith meaning one type way of belief yet we've got different conclusions so one of the two has got human reasoning now i don't want to make it out as if i'm always the right one but i believe as my church does so it's not renee's reasoning but what god has given to us over a century and then of course through via the bible and the, especially the writings of alan white to help us better understand the reason that god has given us brian you've experienced this too right absolutely and uh, i think the worst kind of example of how reason can lead people so astray uh, and become actually um, the tool of the devil was uh, during the late 18th century uh, when the french revolution took place and they actually put a, a lady on a, a, a pedestal um, raised her up and uh, dressed her up and said you know this is who you're going to worship um, the goddess of reason and, and that led sure. them so far from the word of god that uh, france uh, became a despotic uh, 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 rule uh, kingdom that um, People were slaughtered who picked up the Bible, who believed in the Word of God. Uh, the Bibles were burnt in the streets. And, and, and that became the darkness or the night of Paris because all the people who were educated, the people who had studied the Bible, the, the artists, the business people, the intellectuals, they all had to flee from the country. And that put Paris way back in the dark ages. So you can see how mm. easily uh, a reason can corrupt us. And yet, uh, Renier, God doesn't expect us of a blind faith. Yes, we need faith and God has given us enough evidence in his word. In fact, uh, one of my favorite texts in uh, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, The Lord says, come now, let us reason yes. together, says the Lord. Though your sins mm. be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So, so God says, listen, come, come. I will uh, lead you into what is reasonable. You know, uh, Paul also says in Romans 12, um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies to be a living uh, sacrifice, holy and separate with God, which is your reasonable service. So, yes. so God gives us every reason why... Uh, his word is trustworthy and true. Uh, and interesting in verse 19 of uh, Isaiah 1, then it says, If you be willing and obedient, you shall taste the good of the land. So in other words, God wants our reasoning powers to be subject to his word. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we'll be led to obedience. And um, ah, there's just nothing better than that. When you are in yes. the will of God and uh, you have the blessing of God, you know, uh, life can be so, even when it's difficult, 
life can be so happy life can be so fulfilling and you know sometimes I meet people in the business world you know I'm invited to functions and then they've got um, you know whiskey they've got intoxicating wine there on the tables when mm. they have these functions and you know they'll notice that I don't you know and someone will say you know I you have something to drink no I, I don't drink so, you don't drink you know what do you do for fun Man, you know, then that becomes a Bible study, you know. <laughs> but I can tell them a lot of things that I can do that is fulfilling, that is pleasing and wonderful. And I don't have to become intoxicated by liquor to enjoy life. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. So what we need to base our belief, our joys, our reason, our culture, tradition, everything upon is the Bible. And we've said it a lot Amen. already in this lesson. So we don't have to really uh, go into all the details of what the lesson is saying on Thursday. But the point right. is we need to use the Bible. Jesus said, you believe Moses, you need to believe mm. in me. Jesus yeah. being the center of this word. And sure. Desire of Ages, page 671 says, Through the scriptures, mm. the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. Thus he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is right. by the spirit of truth working through the Word of God, that Christ subdues His chosen people to Himself. Mm -hmm. God wants to, Jesus reconciled us through the cross, back unto God. And then God, through the process of sanctification and the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, wants to conform our lives totally, 100%, to the Word of God. Basing our culture, our tradition, our reason, Everything that we believe as a people, it doesn't matter who you are, is to be in line with God's word. What does Amen. his word say? And we must right. be careful because many times our reason and our understanding of God's word, which we think is biblical, yet it is not in line with God's word. And therefore, private interpretation should be taken to, as Spirit of Prophecy says, the people with the gray hair in church. And... Mm reason through and if it is shown that we are not in line with what god's church believes inspired by himself god himself we need to let go of that thought what is your thoughts on this brian the lesson asked this question if private revelation were the final word in spiritual questions why would this lead nothing to but chaos and error uh because people's experiences people's reasoning their understanding uh, will always vary but one thing that is constant is the scriptures the word of God it is truth it is God's revealed will so it's always very important that we line up whatever our experience whatever our culture whatever our tradition is with the word of God uh, th that was the cry of the Reformation you know uh, it was sola scriptura uh, if you can't prove it from the scriptures, Martin Luther would go on to say, then you know what? I'm just not going to accept it. And, and there was mm. so much tradition, there was so much culture that was anti-Christ, that was against the word of God. But they, the reformers, were willing to die rather than to succumb or to capitulate or to uh, in any way transgress God's word. So, you know what? People today somehow so easily... Um, are willing to accept the customs of the world and the world has got much to offer but you know what when we yes. come back to the word of God uh, it is our only infallible source of authority and it's interesting that Jesus uh, you know said to the scribes and the Pharisees you know that you know you err when you read the scriptures and then you point out where the error was and again when it came to this the tradition he says you have made none effect the word of God by you know uh, casting out the commandments and replacing the tradition so we always yes. got to we have the Bible as God's rule of faith. And you know, it's not so easy sometimes because there are some things that are difficult in the Bible, but always start with the plain revealed things. Start with that which is easy and accepted, and then you move on from point to point until you arrive at what God will certainly reveal to you. And you know what? The Holy Spirit has been promised to all those who are willing to study with a willingness to follow that's the most important thing because some people study yes. the Bible for their own reasons some people study the Bible to prove someone wrong some people study the Bible because you know they just want to question God's Word but when we come yes. with the open willing mind we always going to come to the point where God will speak to us and then we have found truth 
Amen. So God's word is our source of authority for our theology. Mm. What we believe is right. based upon the word of God. And when we do have traditions and cultures which do not contradict the word of God, you know, we can hold on to those as long yes. as it doesn't contradict God's word. Amen. Brian, thank you so much for your time today. I know the viewers will see you this afternoon in a very exciting talk um, that God has placed upon your heart. And when we asked you to, to preach a sermon for this revival weekend, you were like, man, you just had the thoughts before we, we, before we asked you. So it shows that God is in control and he's got a special message for us. So don't miss it this afternoon at 3 o'clock. And um, Brian will present the message that God has placed upon his heart in line with revival. Uh, for the viewers, subscribe to the channel. If you've not subscribed yet, subscribe. Leave a comment so that others can see what you are saying. If you were blessed by this lesson study, if you're blessed by the KNFC online YouTube channels. And may God bless you through the rest of this weekend. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. The authority for our theology. I pray, Father, that we would submit to that authority. That we will lay our reason, our culture, our doctrines, whatever we believe, our traditions at your feet. And say, Lord, your will be done. For then we will abide forever. Thank you for all your blessings. Bless us in the rest of this weekend as we are revived by preachers from all over the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Brian, see you next time. Thank you, Renier, and uh, thank you to our viewers too. God bless you all. Sing, he paid the price, and Jesus bore it all. I heard them sing, I'm coming home, and he the master's call. I heard them sing the modern songs and songs of long ago. But amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, so sweet the sound, oh how sweet is the sound, no sweeter sound, sweeter sound in this life could be found. Heard about the Savior's blood, white as white, white as snow, but amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. It was the song my mother sang in sweet and humble voice That music from the world above, it made my soul rejoice Its soothing words and melodies let the rippling waters flow But amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know Amazing grace, so sweet the sound Oh, how sweet is the sound Sweeter song, sweeter song In this life could be found Heard about the Savior's blood White as white, white as snow But amazing grace, so sweet the sound Is the sweetest song I know Amazing grace, so sweet the sound Oh, how sweet is the sound Sweeter song, sweeter song In this life could be found Heard about the Savior's blood White as white, white as snow But amazing grace, so sweet the sound Is the sweetest song I know But amazing grace, so sweet the sound Is the sweetest song I know but amazing grace, so sweet the sound, is the sweetest song I know. But amazing grace, so sweet the sound, is the sweetest song I know. The sweetest, most wonderful.